Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Eric, for your kind uh, introduction. It's always been my honor to work with you in your care. I've learned a lot. <laughs> So I'm going to talk this morning about Athen 10, which is a research or a study that is specifically dedicated to rare disorders. It's through uh, Athen, as its name implies, which is the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network. I'm not sure if you know what Athen is. I think most people do but it is a national nonprofit organization that is dedicated to improve the lives of individuals who are affected with bleeding and clotting disorders. Essentially, it is a national database and organization to utilize data collection, to uh, secure data, advance knowledge, and transform care. Our goal is to collect data nationwide so that we can look at it to improve the care of individuals we're dedicated to serve. We include about 135 hemophilia treatment centers across the United States, and it's a patient-focused interdisciplinary teams that are the partners of Athen that deliver care and I think the population we include is at least 52,000 individuals with bleeding and clotting disorders. Uh, Athen affiliates vary across the country in terms of what they look like. Some of them are through healthcare delivery systems that include academic research centers, children's hospitals, and freestanding free centers. Uh, Athen sponsors research studies so that we can include the data into this national database. The database that is utilized by Athen is secure and uh, follows all national guidelines, uh, including HIPAA protection uh, for conducting data collection and research. So it's a very secure system. The specific project that we're talking about, and I think Dr. Diane Nugent spoke to you yesterday, is dedicated towards rare coagulation disorders. Now, hemophilia A and B and C are rare coagulation disorders, but the disorders we're looking to address through this program are less common, more rare than even hemophilia. Dr. Nugent and I are the principal investigators and we have a consortium of funders, including Novo Nordisk, who helped us launch the project. And then Dr. Nugent's organization, mine and Athen, all provide some support for the project. We launched the project in August of 2020. And as you recall, that was uh, in the pandemic. So, or the beginning of it and um, no, now I'm having difficulty remembering when everything happened, but it was 2020. So it did impede our ability to get going. What we're using is the national database that was developed by Athen initially to collect information through treatment uh, centers. We're also utilizing the laboratory services through Dr. Nugent's center, the CIBD, who is performing the genetic testing uh, to look at these disorders. Uh, it is what we call an Athen data set project. So Athen itself has a project that uh, you have to sign a consent for, and it's the data set project. And what that does is um, documents your agreement to provide into the national data set anonymized data that helps us um, understand your individual bleeding disorder, adds it to other individuals across the country who have similar bleeding disorders and allows us to hopefully look at that data and advance care. If you agree to be in that data set project, then you 
and you have a very rare bleeding disorder, then you can also be in the Athen Data 10 rare disorder. But you have to agree to be in the Athen Data Set project as well. And I'll get to a little bit later why that is. <clears throat> so the Athen Data Set shares health information. It includes the type of bleeding or clotting disorder, if you're using any treatments, whether you're responding or not. If you have genetic information already, that can be included. There are also other data points that are included, but we do not include into that data set any personal identifying information. So that data can't be linked uh, on a national level to you individually. It is linked to your treatment center and your treatment center may know who you are, but not anyone from a national level. And again, this helps us understand clinical, social, economic barriers uh, that affect patients and families, the development of inhibitors, looking at trends, look at genetics of bleeding and clotting disorders, look at the effectiveness of treatments. We um, work to develop standards of care, which I can tell you for very rare bleeding disorders is difficult to do. We look at new FDA approved therapies and how patients are responding to them and whether they're developing any adverse events um, that are important to note. And it also can inform advocacy, community support, and education. So the specific goals of Athen 10 are to understand on a deeper level what we call the phenotypic, which is how someone expresses a disorder, and the genotypic data, which is the actual change in the gene uh, for these very rare disorders. Through this system, we do provide free genetic testing for people with these very rare clotting disorders. Now, for example, you may be diagnosed with factor 10 deficiency. So we know you have factor 10 deficiency because your factor 10 activity level is low, uh, but you may not have had genetic testing. You may want uh, genetic testing for your own family's information. Uh, you may want to be able to tell people who are carriers of this disorder. Um, and one person with, for example, a factor 10 level of a specific percent may not express that disorder exactly the same way as another person with the same level. Having the genetic testing may help inform how someone expresses that disorder, but also having other information about that individual and other genes that impact factor 10 or the expression of factor 10 may also be important. So how do you get into this study? Well, your treatment center would identify you as a potentially eligible individual. You actually have to have a diagnosis of a rare coagulation disorder before you enter. In other words, if you have a bleeding disorder and your physician or treatment center says, well, I know you have a bleeding disorder, but I can't actually identify uh, what it is. And believe it or not, in this day and age, that still happens. <clears throat> and it doesn't happen necessarily because your physician or treatment center isn't doing a good job. It's just that we don't know everything yet. Uh, you can't enter this system because this system is not for diagnosing individuals with unidentified bleeding disorders. It's to learn more about individuals who have identified very rare coagulation disorders. You have to receive care through an Athen affiliated treatment center. So if you want to enter the study and you're not seen at an Athen affiliated treatment center, you can look online through the Athen website and find the nearest Athen affiliated treatment center to talk to them about entering this study. And again, you have to have opted in to the Athen data set because we use that information to go with the genetic testing that we obtain. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 
uh, to better understand the bleeding disorders that we're looking at. So what bleeding disorders are we looking at? Uh, fibrinogen, which is factor one, is not just um, a disorder where your fibrinogen may be lowered. You may have no fibrinogen, which is called afibrinogenemia. <clears throat> you can have what's called dysfibrinogenemia, where you make an abnormal protein. And some people who make abnormal fibrinogen proteins either bleed excessively or clot excessively. Um, you could have slightly low fibrinogen, which is called hypofibrinogenemia. There is a form called hypodysfibrinogenemia. So fibrinogen is a little bit complicated. Then there's factor two, which is prothrombin, factor five, factor seven. And I know there's been a lot of work through Chess and Dr. Nugent uh, on factor seven deficiency, which is really quite interesting and helps us understand that disorder because for a long time, we couldn't predict who might be at risk of increased bleeding despite uh, what their level was. Factor 10, factor 11, which is also called hemophilia C. Factor 13, there's actually a disorder that is a combined factor five and eight deficiency, PI1 deficiency, which is extraordinarily uncommon. It's called plasminogen activator inhibitor one. Plasminogen deficiency, <clears throat> which is a deficiency of a clotting factor, but is actually not a bleeding disorder. It has uh, different interesting manifestations. Then a variety of different platelet disorders, which are listed here. And then some other, whoops, I can't touch that uh, little mouse. <clears throat> and then a variety of other disorders, which are listed here as well. <clears throat> So what are the data elements that we're actually collecting that help us inform um, a description of how someone bleeds for, with a specific disorder? <clears throat> well, we are collecting demographics in terms of ethnicity, health insurance, and population of origin. Um, and actually, you wouldn't think that that matters very much, but it does in a sense because different individuals of different races and ethnicities carry different modifying genetic uh, traits that can impact uh, their bleeding. It's also important for us to know in terms of ability to access services, are people of different ethnicities, sexes, races, health insurance, or a different population, able to access, get diagnosed uh, as quickly as we want them to, or do they have delays in diagnosis and then therefore suffer more morbidity related to their disorder? We want to know about their medical history. Do they have other individuals within their family who have rare coagulation disorders, their height and weight, um, whether they've uh, had infections, bloodborne infections. And the reason <clears throat> we want to know about that is for some of these disorders, uh, the treatment uh, for a long time, or even at this time, has been dependent on the use of blood products. And we want to know to what extent the use of those products has impacted the patients with a specific disorder. That helps us say this population really needs better treatment and to lobby to um, pharmaceutical companies and the FDA the needs of these populations. Also comorbidities, other problems that they've had, um, surgeries and procedures that they've had to undergo. Specific to the rare bleeding disorder, <clears throat> we want to know their primary diagnosis, so for example, factor seven, factor 10, whatever that diagnosis is, when was that diagnosis established? What was the reason for the diagnosis testing? Was it because somebody had bleeding? Was it because somebody had a family history? Was it because they were going to undergo surgery and then someone found an abnormal clotting factor activity or test? 
what is the baseline factor activity level that was determined at diagnosis? Was there what we call an antigenic assessment at diagnosis? So for example, your factor 10 activity may be 10%, but your antigen, the amount of protein that's there could be normal. And what that tells you is that the genetic alteration that caused that deficiency led to um, a change in the clotting factor that impacted its ability to form a clot, but the actual amount of protein produced is normal. That helps us tease things out. What kind of treatments have you undergone? How many visits have you had to had for uh, had to have for your uh, medical care and any kind of bleeding history if it's available? And then what do we do for the project besides all of this data collection and questions we ask and going through medical histories is we collect um, some specimens to send to Dr. Nugent's laboratory to do this genetic panel. Now this genetic panel uses what we call next-gen sequencing and the disorders that I spoke about before that were listed are the actual genes that are within this panel that are run through this system to identify a change in the genetic sequence that led to that disorder. Now, when we do this panel, so for example, if you come in again with a diagnosis of factor 10 deficiency, we do the entire panel on you. So we don't just look at the gene change in factor 10, we look at all of the genes that are on that panel. Now, why do we do that? Well, one, actually, it's less expensive to create a panel and run through the entire panel for every individual. But two, <clears throat> two is we may actually find that an individual has changes in some of these other clotting factors, and that may impact why uh, their bleeding phenotype or their expression is different than someone else. The results are sent as a secure file to the treatment center and the time it takes from the sample collection to obtain the entire panel result is about nine months. Now it doesn't take that long to run the test, but to conserve resources, what we're doing is collecting samples and trying to get enough samples to run on the panel at one time to be cost effective. So for example, it's not cost effective to run three people on the entire panel. Um, it's more cost effective to run 30 people on the entire panel at one time. And then those results will also be imported into what's called clinical manager. Clinical manager is the national system that is available through Athen as a database um, into each treatment center. How many people have we gotten into this program to date? Well, it's uh, nice that we can now report 561 individuals from 55 treatment centers across the country have been entered into this project. You can see in the beginning when we opened the project in 2020, um, between opening and August 31st, 2021, we had 228 participants and clearly that was impacted by the COVID pandemic. Between August 2021 and September 2022, we've more than doubled that number as things have opened up and we now have, as I said, 561 participants. Oops. Now this slide is a little difficult to read but what you can see is the breakdown of individuals with different clotting disorders or diagnosis that have been entered into the system. So the most frequent is factor seven deficiency and of all rare disorders, actually factor seven is the most frequent. It's about one in 500,000. So 245 individuals or 46% of the people entered to date have factor seven deficiency. 
And then you can see there's quite a big gap between 245 and the other individuals who have been entered. So factor 11, Glanzman's thrombostenia, which is a platelet disorder. Um, let's see, platelet function disorders that are hereditary that we can show impact um, that are genetic in nature uh, are another one of the more frequent disorders. And then um, some factor five deficiencies, factor 10, factor 13, and dysfibrinogenemia. So we're getting some interesting data and some good results. Uh, for the people who have very kindly agreed to help us with this research project and enter into the Athen 10 program. And now we're open for discussion. I just have a quick question. I tried to sign up back in February. I must have saw this on a Zoom. Are you closed, do you know, for U of M patients from the University of Michigan? Because that's what the doctor there had told me. Ah, okay. That's a very good question. So what we tried to do with this program was limit the number of individuals per treatment center that could enter. Uh, and the reason we did that is we have, as you know, Eric talked about limited funding in life, we had limited funding. And we didn't want one treatment center who was better organized than everybody else to rush into this system and take the majority of spots away from other treatment centers that might have taken longer to get organized and going. Um, you can, so each, what I think Michigan is telling you is that they've reached the number of treatment spots that uh, they had, patient spots they had available. Despite that, you can go to the treatment center and ask for an exception. And then, the excuse Thank me. Thank you. So the um, treatments, so it's the treatment center may say, no, we've already filled our spots. But what you can tell them is if they go to the study coordinators at Athen, we get requests all the time, like this treatment center wants to add an extra patient with this diagnosis. And then Dr. Nugent and I say yes. Awesome. Thanks for that little trick. <laughs> um, another question. I saw a couple more hands. I know there's more hands. Where are they? Where are my hands? In the front? Oh, good. Good morning, Dr. Shapiro. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you for everything you're doing regarding the research project. It's awesome. Um, I have a couple of questions and I'll try not to take up too much time, but since the genetic specimen collection from the patient is anonymous and all of the research is done based on anonymity of the patient, how then does the patient who donated that sample get the results that might be very different from what they thought they had? Okay. Okay. So- That's when I said it was anonymous, it's anonymous on a national level. So if I wanted to go in and say, okay, Athen, as a principal investigator on this study, I now want to pull data on everyone with factor 10 deficiency who was entered. I want to know their sex, their age, their level, their bleeding phenotype. I'll get that data, but it won't have any patient. I won't know where those patients came from. The treatment center who entered that individual into the study knows who you are. You have a unique identifying number within the Athen national data set that's assigned to you, okay? So your treatment center uses that number. They send the sample to Dr. Nugent under a number and their treatment center. Dr. Nugent doesn't know who you are. Athen doesn't know who you are but your treatment center knows who you are. Got it. Great answer. And real quickly, I've spoken to a lot of patients here who like myself, and I know that you're very well um, highly regarded in this area and <laughs> know my hematologist, Rebecca Cruz Jaris, very oh, yes. well in Seattle. She's wonderful. Uh, yes, she is. 
And I want to ask on behalf of the other patients who have told me that they've heard about this, but their center, like mine, is not set up in reaching out to us. Do you have an idea when that will happen or? So I didn't, I showed that on the slide, but I didn't actually say anything. And what I said was, let me look at my slides again. I, I don't said think that, I'm alone. Has anyone else? Yeah. Had that? Yeah. Okay. So there were out of that 135 treatment centers in the country, 59 centers that agreed to participate and activate the study at their site. Out of that 59 centers, 55 have entered patients. So what does that mean? There's a lot of treatment centers there who haven't activated the study at their site. Why is that? That's usually because of local resources. To activate a study at a site, you have to have research coordinators, you have to go through budgeting and you know institutional review processes or the national review. There's an actually a national IRB for this study but it takes resources to do. And that center may not have the resources to do that study. So what you can do is you can go onto the Athen website and you can look to see where the nearest treatment center is who actually has activated the study. You could also ask your treatment center if they could work with another treatment center who's activated the study to get your information and sample to them and submit it. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, I'm a patient at Mayo. Uh, I live in New Jersey though. So Minnesota to New Jersey, Mayo is my HTC in Minnesota. Um, they told I didn't me know there was 10. a direct train from New Jersey to Minnesota. There isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's three days of pain of nothing but corn farms. Um, <laughs> but they told me that they were not running the study at Mayo currently and that they could refer me to Milwaukee. Milwaukee told me that I had to be a patient there for them to do it. So well, I went back to New Jersey and I asked Penn, which is the only one that's close enough to be doing it to me. And they told me that I was not able to get in with them. I talked with Dr. Nugent about it and she said that she might be able to do it through telehealth. Yeah. How would we go about getting this started then? Um, okay. So if Dr. So yeah, we can do it through telehealth. We can do a visit. Um, we can actually go through Athen and get permission to enter data into your into that center system or do it separately from that system to get you entered. Okay. If Dr. Nugent is willing to do it, and I know she has done it, especially during the pandemic, uh, for many patients across the country, you can start there. Okay. Did she give you your con her contact information? I have her email. Um, I spent like three weeks trying to get her on the phone and got nothing, got voicemail repeatedly. So I emailed her. And yeah. She her, but I don't I'm know sorry. how the logistics of it are going to work if they have to do lab draws and such. Um, you're, you're with Dr. Redding in Minnesota? No. Uh, pardon, Ani. Okay. Hook. Is that the same treatment it's center? Mayor's uh, Mayo's HTC and oh Rochester. Mayo Dr. Pruthi yeah his center yeah yeah okay um I'm sure this can get figured out if you want to get entered okay um you can uh Eric can give you my email and you can email me and I know Dr. Pruthi I can write him okay. and copy Dr. Nugent as well okay thank you Hi, Dr. Shapiro, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm a Canadian and I submitted my sample to uh, Dr. Nugent in Austin and she kindly gave me the results of my study. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, my data or anybody else who's in Canada can be included in the Athen 10. Thank mm. you. Oh boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wish we had um, a 
better international system for this, but each country has their own data collection system. The only way to do it is through, again, telehealth and getting uh, a visit and a sample that way. Uh, getting samples across borders, it's possible to set to ship samples that way. Um, it's sometimes not so easy. We, we'd have to get um, your treatment center to help. And I don't know, um, it depends on the center in Canada. I know some of the treatment centers there. I'm not exactly sure. I know some of them have very, very strong capabilities for genetic analysis, um, but I don't know all of them. Where, where in Canada are you? Toronto. Yeah, so they have advanced testing there too. Thank you. Next question. Good morning, Dr. Shapiro. So I had tried to enter Athen 10 and through the original genetic testing that Dr. Nugent did here through CHESS, I was diagnosed with qualitative factor seven deficiency with two variants, mm -hmm. but my actual level is 60. Mm. When I tried to enter Athen 10, I was told that I did not meet the criteria because of being qualitative. Is that true? Um, huh. I... I think you you can still enter, but Dr. Nugent already did your genetic analysis through the Factor Seven specific she project. Did, but I would did. like, but I would like the qualitative to be part of Athen Ten, the Athen Ten data set, and that's the reason why I would want to do this. Yeah. So what we get through Athen, Dr. Nugent and I, when I say we is we get queries sometimes from treatment centers about whether an individual is eligible or not. If Dr. Nugent already knows you, she can tell that treatment center whether you're eligible. Okay, perfect. So we'll just ask for an exception, just like the rest. Yeah, just perfect. ask your treatment center to actually request to Dr. Nugent um, permission whether you're eligible or not. They may be looking at the strict criteria and saying because your level's not abnormal, you're not eligible. When she did the original genetic testing, it looks like 60 with the current assays that are available as far as diagnostic testing. But when she used she took it in vivo versus in vitro, and she used oxen and human plasma. And when she did that, I was at zero. But with the current diagnostic testing available in just traditional laboratories, and upon further evaluation, I learned that most of that was developed in 1965, which yeah. is very, 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 very strange to me that we're living in almost 2023 and we're using antiquated technologies. It's pretty silly. Well, it's not so antiquated. Um, they're good technologies. They just don't tell us everything about clotting factor deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And the issue is, is how people look at the interpretation of the test results. OK, so if you look at the test result and say you're either normal or not, then you get into this mindset of it's not that. But you have to look at um, what does that test tell you based upon how it's performed and do I need something else? Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. So my daughter was diagnosed with factor seven deficiency in 2019, and she actually today is turning 10. Um, and I talked to her HTC about getting her enrolled in the Athen 10, and they are listed on the Athen website as an affiliate. How do I know if they're actually activated and not just an affiliate? Because when I mentioned it to them, they said, that's a lot of paperwork for one patient, and she'd probably be our only eligible patient. So they never followed up since April. And I keep asking, and I've never gotten an answer of how to get her enrolled. Well, 
it sounds to me like they're not an activated site. So again, what you have to do is go to the Athen website, look at what's the closest activated site or ask your physician to work with someone to say, I understand for one patient, you don't have the resources to do this, but how do I get in? Right. Dr. Shapiro, I we have a question um, from that. someone attending virtually. It says, my HTC is dragging their feet uh, for an appointment. Is there a deadline to participate? It is a time limited study in the sense of we only have so many resources to collect so many samples. I can frankly tell you that I don't recall a recent conversation with Dr. Nugent or Athen to close the study. So it's open. Um, and so I wouldn't say there's an imminent deadline, but it would be nice to get people in who want to come in. Definitely. Thank you. Dr. Shapiro, for those of us who had samples collected by Dr. Nugent for her research project, could those samples be used for Athlin? Um, I would have to ask Diane whether she ran the entire panel or just the seven. Um, if she hasn't run the entire panel or entered the data into Athen 10, then um, it could be done. She might still have a um, sample from you. Uh, so it could be done that way. Um, my, when I received back in Austin, the, the paperwork and all that stuff to do the genetic testing, I was under the impression I was supposed to bring it to my hematologist and let them do the blood work and all that stuff. Cause only the hematologist touches my daughter when it comes to anything with a needle. And, um, she literally, she looked at it and she said, what do I do with this? And I said, well, we're supposed to get the testing and everything. She goes, well, I'll have to research it. That was back probably not even three months after the August or the Austin trip, I've yet heard back from anything. No blood work has been done or nothing. So I don't even know where to go from here. I don't even have the papers anymore. Okay. She took them and then that was that. Okay. So let me um, tell you what I think I'm understanding from what you're saying. I think you were involved in Dr. Nugent's factor seven deficiency study. And GT. And GT. Okay. And she gave you paperwork to have the blood work done locally and sent. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. So the way your treatment center is looking at it is, oh my gosh, this is a study that isn't open at our site. And I'm not sure what I have to do. Um, to open a study or to participate in this to send your sample. Uh, I think that is likely a miscommunication between Dr. Nugent's project and the center in the sense that she's just asking for the blood work mm -hmm. to be sent to her um, as a laboratory test. And they, it's not, they don't have to open a study at their site. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're looking at it from, oh no, we have to open this. So I think, um, you, do you have an email for your center? Yeah. She says, yes, she does. She doesn't okay. have a handheld mic anymore. <laughs> okay, and does she have an email for Dr. Nugent Center who participated, where she participated in that uh, project? Uh, she's not sure. Okay. So I think, you know, what would be best would be an email to both sites saying, I did this through you. I want to continue to participate. I want my sample sent. Can you communicate with my center to explain to them that they don't have to open this at their site and just have to send the sample? She says, okay, thank you. Yes, I have a question. I have dense body storage pool disease and my only treatment option is platelets, but I still hemorrhage. I'm positive my mother had an inherited bleeding disorder. I didn't realize that until after she died, but 
she always had problems with surgeries. Sometimes she just didn't wake up for days, but she also had knees that looked like somebody from Africa who had never had, a, had any product. And if I'm able to do the genetic testing, will that help me find out if there's, if I have something else that's in fact affecting my bleeding uh, disorder and also my treatment? Yes. I'm in Chicago. Um, who does Northwestern, is that part of the, is that part of the study or the research or who is I in Chicago? Yeah, I don't know every activated site across the country, but Athen does. Okay. Okay, thank you. And there are a number of treatment centers in Chicago. Right. So if one isn't activated, another might. Right. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Any other questions? I just want to make certain Dr. Shapiro. Oh, she can hear me. Okay. <laughs> this doesn't transfer. Dr. Amy Shapiro, you and Dr. Diane Nugent, this is Connie Montgomery, and I just want to say thank you to you all taking the time <laughs> to look closely at us ultra rares and research and find the answers. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're sweet. There's a lot of questions. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Any other questions, thoughts? Oh, I've got one more at the front. Hold on. And this might be our last one. We'll get ready to wrap it up. Um, can you talk a little bit about the results you've gotten so far from Athen 10? Uh, I showed up the uh, diagnoses that we've had. We haven't analyzed all the data. Uh, so we have not gone in and looked at the entire panel for every patient, their bleeding disorder, and their phenotypic data. We're still collecting data. And that'll so all we have time. right now is diagnoses. But it's a start, right? Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. This is There'll great. be a lot of data. I, I think, you know, what is unfortunate to me, from my perspective, is there's still so few of some of these very rare disorders. You know, if you look at the work that Dr. Nugent did in factor seven, it takes quite a few individuals with that disorder to begin to make sense of why people bleed differently. So if you're looking at some of these other disorders, it, we may not have enough people in a specific category to completely understand that disorder. I have a particular interest, not only in all of these, but in something called plasminogen deficiency. And we're doing an international study on plasminogen deficiency to try to collect enough individuals. Uh, we have 70, about 75 people internationally. That's how rare it is. So it's really hard to get enough people. It's a small group. Wow. All right. Can we um, give Dr. Nugent a round of applause? Oh, well, no. she was Dr. yesterday. Shapiro. But I'll give her one. All right, too. Dr. Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the two of you are probably my biggest heroes in the hematology world for the work that you do and how well you've all listened to um, our group of families. They're, they're a small group, but they're really mighty. Um, and we just want to thank you so much for your time. Well, your I want to thank you because we learned from you. We learn what we don't know, which is an awful lot, unfortunately. Hi, <laughs> Eric. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro. Bye. We appreciate you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs>